Amen. Turn me in your Bibles. Start that position. Turn me in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 16 and 25. Proverbs 16. Go ahead, start the music, Bishop. And 25. When you guys say amen, we should apologize for the music, but God is good anyway. We ain't gonna let the devil get the victory on that. Proverbs 16 and 25. When you guys say amen. amen. If you ain't guys say hold up. All right, Proverbs 16 and 25 says this. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. If you follow the way that everybody else is going, you're headed in the wrong direction. And the way that they're going is going to lead to death. If you do what everybody else is doing, you're going to go in the direction that leads to death. And the thing about it is it seems right. And it seems right because everybody's doing it. It seems right because everybody's doing, everybody's falling that way. And you don't want to be a weirdo because you say, I'm not doing what everybody else is doing. But the Bible says there's a way and it seems right. And if you follow that way that everybody else is going, it's going to lead to a path that leads to death. So you got to be careful of doing what everybody else is doing. You can't be like everybody else. God did not call you to be like everybody else. In fact, your very eyeballs are, are very unique. Your, each fingertip on your body is very unique. Each hair strand that you have is very unique. God made you special. He made you unique. He didn't make you to be like everybody else. And he said, be careful when you're like everyone else. Be careful when you're doing what everybody else is doing. One of the scariest things about this whole COVID thing, everybody's doing it. Everybody's getting the shots. Everybody's doing this. And the Bible says when everybody's doing something, you should run the other direction. Because it says if you're doing what everybody else is doing, you're headed for whatever they're headed for. So we have to be careful when we're doing what everybody else is doing. Next, turn to me to 2 Corinthians 6 and 17. 2 Corinthians 6 and 17. Way in the back. 2 Corinthians 6 and 17. 2 Corinthians 6 and 17 says this. It says, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. Turn it up, Bishop. Saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And then verse 18 says, And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. God says, come out from among them. It says, God says, stop being like them. God says, I, you my kids, you're not their kids. And the thing is, we try to act like we're sons of Satan. We're trying to act like we're sons and daughters of Satan. We do everything that the world do. Then we say, God bless me. And God's looking like you and say, you're acting just like everybody else. You're my kids. I remember growing up in my mother's household. And, and one of the things was, my friends were able to do cool things. And my friends were able to hang out late at night. And my friends were able to, to, to talk on the phone late at night, do all these strange things. And my mother would often say, I don't care what they do in their house, but in this house, you're going to follow my rules. And what God wants you to know is, he says, you're my children. You can't do what they do. You can't be like them. He says, because I call you my son and my daughter. And because you're my son and my daughter, you got to act different than everybody else in the world. You can't be just like the world. Because if you're like the world, you're going to get what the world gets. And when the world gets certain things, it's a bad example. It's a bad result. You don't want to be like the world. God says, I call you to be separate. He says, I call you my sons and daughters. And that's powerful. I want to be a son of God. I don't want to be a son of man. I want to be a son of God. I don't want to be a son of man. See, the thing is, if I'm a son of God, then I'm his, one of his children. And if I'm one of his children, I'm blessed just like he wants me to be. But if I'm a son of man, I'm going to lead to a life that leads to curses. 
And I'm going to lead to a life that leads to an early grade. I'm going to lead to a life that leads to financial stress. I'm going to lead to a life that leads to cancer, to diabetes, to high blood pressure. Because that's what happens when you're sons of men. But when you're sons of God, you lead to a path that leads down the world that he called you to be. You want to be a son of God and not a son of man. Learn to be accepted by God and not to follow the ways of man. Next, turn the week back to Matthew 7 and 12. 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 I'd like to bring my own little speaker, praise the Lord. Matthew 7 and 12. It says, therefore, all things whatsoever ye would do that men should do to you, do you even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye that ye would do to men, they should also do to you. Do ye even to them, for this is the law and the prophets of men. Uh, we used to say in, in the neighborhood, what goes around comes around. Treat people how you want to be treated. God said this is the, ba the very basic law and the prophet of men. God says treat other people how you want somebody to treat you. Why is this important? Because one thing that separates you from the world is how do you treat each other? How do you treat one another? How do you treat strangers? How do you treat your children? How do you treat your loved ones? How do you treat your best friends? How do you treat people that you ain't met yet? How do you treat people at your workplace? That distinguishes you as a child of God. Uh, she talked about how she got into it with somebody on the street, and then she said she felt bad because she had to go in on the brother. But the, the blessing is, she felt bad after doing it. That means she's growing. That means the next time she's in an incident, she'll be better. We should be better in incidences. We should learn how to treat our family members better. When somebody disappoints you, learn how to forgive. One of the greatest things that God did for us is he sent his son to die for our sins. Why did God send his son to die for our sins? Because he wanted to forgive us for the evil and the wickedness that we do. And we need to have the same heart that God has. A heart that forgives. Thanksgiving is coming, and many of you are going to be around family members that some of you don't like, going to be around relatives that you can't stand. And God says, this season, learn how to forgive. Because your family is the closest unit that you have. Without your family, what do you have? Nothing. Without your family, who are you? Nobody. Because your family represents who you are. So when you come together this Thanksgiving, learn how to forgive. Just say, you know what? That's behind me. I'm going to put that thing behind, and I'm going to love you like it, whatever never happened. Move forward with your family. Learn how to love as Jesus Christ loved us. Next, turn with me to Matthew 22 and 37. Matthew 22 and 37. Matthew 22 and 37. Matthew 22 and 37 says this. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. In verse 39, And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And it says, On these two commandments hang all the laws and the prophets. The first law is, we should love God. We should love God. Uh, a lot of people say, I'm a Christian. A lot of people say, I love Jesus. A lot of people say, I believe in God. But you look in their life, and you'll see the evidence. You check their record. How often do they go to church? Not often at all. How often do they read their Bible? Not often at all. How often do they pay tithes? Not often at all. But then they say, I love Jesus. I'm going to heaven anyhow. And God says, where's your proof? Where's your evidence? See, God is not like us. I had to tell a young man the uh, other day. He was talking about, I posted something about tithing online. And he said, uh, well, you ain't got to give nothing. And I said, you ain't got to prove nothing to me. I'm just the messenger. My job is just to tell you what the Bible says. I said, that's between you and God because God is the judge. Matter of fact, turn to Galatians 6 and 7. 
Galatians 6 and 7. Thank you, Jesus. Galatians 6 and 7. Galatians 6 and 7. Galatians 6 and 7. That means I ain't got it. <laughs> Galatians 6 and 7. Somebody got it before me. Go ahead and read it. Galatians 6 and 7. It's, go ahead. You got it? Good. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. See, you ain't doing nothing for me. Uh, if you don't pay your tithes, I'm not really affected. I tell people this. I say, when you pay your tithes, I'm not necessarily blessed by your tithes because your tithes blesses you. When I pay my tithes, I get blessed. That's why I can tell you, ooh, I got $2,000. Ooh, I got $20,000. Because I pay big tithes. The bigger your tithes, the bigger your blessings. The lesser your tithes, the lesser your blessings. And the Bible says, God, you can read it right here. It says Galatians 6 and 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. God ain't playing. This ain't me. I didn't write no Bible. God says, whatever you sow, that's what you reap. Whatever you sow in, in, in your love life, that's what you reap. Whatever you sow amongst your friends, that's what you reap. Whatever you sow in your work, that's what you reap. So if you learn how to sow good seeds, you have a good harvest. But if you sow in seeds of distress, sow in seeds of pain, sow in seeds of negativity, that's what you reap. Uh, it's so sad when I sit here about young brothers getting cut down, young in their life. But how were they in their life? What did they do? How did they treat other people? Because the thing is, God sees everything. God sees everything. So when I hear about these tragedies, I go, ooh, that's terrible. But I don't know what they did. God does. That's why we have to be careful because God sees everything. And Satan records everything that you do. So the thing is, be careful the seeds that you sow. Be careful the seeds that you sow. Turn to 1 John 4 and 6. 1 John 4 and 6. We're almost done. 1 John 4 and 6. 1 John chapter 4. Go down to verse 4. And we're going to read 4 through 6. It says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Then it says, they are of the world. Therefore, they speak of the world, and the world heareth them. Then it says, we are of God. He says, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God cannot hear us. Hereby know we that we are the spirit of truth and not the spirit of error. God says, great is he that is in you than is he that is in the world. God has put something in you that he didn't put in the world. And God says, whatever is in you, your essence is greater than the world. You got to start to believe that what God has deposited in you makes you different than everybody in the world. Uh, when you walk down the street, you're different than the world. People start to look at you. And I remember I was talking to this brother once, and he said, I know you are a man of God. I didn't tell him I was a pastor. I didn't tell him none of that. He said, I know you are a man of God. I was like, what, really? I'm, like, I, I, I'm on the motorcycle. How you know? And he just said, there's something different about you. Your essence speaks values. God says he deposited something inside of you. So you have to walk in that and know that God has put this thing in you. You are greater than you know because God put something inside of you that's great. That's why you have to start acting like you're great. You got to start studying like you're great. You got to start working like you're great. You got to start believing that you're great because God says you are great. And many of us don't believe we're great because we're looking at social media and we're looking at the television and we listen to YouTube and all this foolishness. And we think if we don't have what the world have, we're not great. It's so sad that in the last two days, a hundred young black people robbed a store called Nordstrom's. And they ran up in there. And they stole all the Gucci and the guest jeans and all that. So that they could take home and put it on and feel good about themselves. 
Not knowing that they sowing seeds of discord. Not knowing that they set themselves up for prison. Not knowing that they're going to mess up their future. And then they're going to, uh, years later, things are going to happen and transpire. And they're going to end up in negative situations. God says you're greater than a pair of guest jeans. God says you're greater than a Louis Vuitton purse. You're greater than a Mercedes Benz. Because God put something inside you that makes you great. And most of us don't feel great. I didn't feel great until I found out who I was. I remember a long time ago, the lady named Dr. Earlene Piper Man, she was at my college. And she said, Hibbert, and she didn't like me. She said, you are great. And I was like, what? Because I wasn't feeling so great. My grades was bad, and I was about to get kicked out of college. Uh, things was going down, and she said, you're great. She said, one day you're going to find out how great you really are. And you got to start believing that you're great because you really are great. There's good things in you. God says he put more inside of you than inside of in, in the world. So don't worry about the, what the world has. Worry about your relationship with God because you are great. You are beautiful. You are special. You are intelligent. You are smart. You are wonderful. You are what God called you to be. You are great. Don't worry about what the devil has. See, try, stop trying to get what Satan has and get what God has for you. Because God says, I made you greater than what the world is. Amen. Next, turn with me. Turn to me. The first John 4 and 8. Go down a couple of scriptures. First John 4 and 8. First John 4 and 8. First John 4 and 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God. That's good, because a lot of Christians get messed up on that one. He that doesn't show love doesn't know God. He that doesn't display love doesn't know God. For God is love. The very definition of God is love. The very definition of God is love. God is love. And if you're not loving other people, if you're not known for being loving, then you don't know God. God is love. Well, I'm angry. That's fine. You'll get through that. You'll get to a point to where now, instead of displaying anger, you're displaying love. God is love. And God loved you so much that he gave his only son because God is love. Well, if God is love, why is there so much evil in the world? If God is love, why my family struggling? If God is world, why my family and finances like this? If God is love, why is there so much evil in the world? Because the world doesn't serve God. The world serves money. See, God is love. But see, if you love money, then you're loving evil. Matter of fact, turn to 1 Timothy 6 and 10. 1 Timothy 6 and 10. And this one ain't nowhere on it, but this ain't my church. I didn't work here. 1 Timothy 6 and 10. Verse 1 Timothy 6 and 10 says this. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some covet after it, they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Woo, that's deep. Let me read from the Living Bible Translation. It says, for the love of money is the first step towards all kinds of sin. Some people have even turned away from God because of their love for it, and as a result have pierced themselves with many sorrows. When you chase money, you chase pain. When you chase money, you chase debt. When you chase money, you chase stress. When you chase money, you chase all kinds of things that is going to come back to you and going to destroy you. Because love, money leads towards evil. Well, why y'all take tithes then? Oh, I'm glad you said it. We'll talk to that about later on. The love of money leads to evil. And the sad part about it is, many of us have chosen to chase money than chasing God. We chase money rather than chasing your purpose. See, the thing is, God did not create you to be poor. Let me say that again. God did not create no man to be poor. God creates you to be rich. Jesus says, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He didn't create you to be poor. Poverty is a curse. And it's a curse because people don't choose to do what God called them to do. See, when God created you, he gave you a purpose. He gave you a gift. And what we choose to do is chase the bag. Chase the bag. 
chase the bag. And you chasing the bag, and the bag's leading, and the devil just seems like, yeah, follow me, follow me, follow me. Ba -da 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 -da. There it is. I got you. Got you. You chasing the bag, and the bag leads to tricks. Satan is very tricky. Satan is very clever because the devil tells you what you want to hear. Because he tells you, everybody else is doing it. You missing out. We all coming up. Follow me. And you follow him, and it's a trick. He's leading you. He's like a fox. See, a fox is one of the most dangerous animals in the, in the animal kingdom. Because a fox ain't big and ferocious. It's little and it's cute. And, and the fox is really smart. See, a wolf is big, got big old teeth. You see a wolf, you're going to run. But if you see the fox, you're going to run up and pet it. And the fox just keeps smiling. And next thing you know, he's going to lead you to the hole and then kill you. Because he's tricky. He's clever. And Satan is a clever fox. Because what he does is he tells you what you want to hear. And he boosts your ego. And he gets you caught up. And he shows you the things that you like. And he leads you down a hole and he traps you. The Bible says, be careful because Satan walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Setting tricks and traps to get you. You have to be careful about the things that you do and not serve the God of money. Next, turn with me to Genesis 22. Genesis 22. Genesis 22. We're going to read verses 1 through 13. Genesis 22. We're going to read verses 1 through 13. Genesis is the beginning of the Bible. i got to get some Bible. Bishop, please remind me to buy some Bibles tomorrow. Genesis 22, verses 1 through 13. And it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said to Abraham, Behold, here I am. And he says, Take your son now, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him for a burnt offering upon the mountain which I tell thee of. All right, the short version of the story is this. God had called a man named Abraham, Father Abraham. Abraham was the first one to actually give tithes. He's the one that God taught to tithe. The tithe would, would belong to Abraham. Long story short, God says, I'm going to test Abraham. Abraham had only one son that he loved. His name was Isaac. So God said, Abraham, I need an offering from you today in church. Abraham, Abraham. He said, I'm talking to you, son. He said, I need you to bring an offering to church. So, so Abraham like, all right, God, what you need? He said, you need my money? He said, no. He said, you need my car? He said, no. He, he said, what, what you need, God? He said, I want your son. Now, imagine this. This is his only son. This is his favorite son. This is the son that he longed to have. God says, I don't want your money. I, I, don't, I, don't, want the, I don't want what's, what's in your pocket. I don't want what's in your refrigerator. I want your son. So he said, will you give me my your son? Abraham said, let's go, son. And he took his son to the altar. And he got there. And he pulled the knife out. He said, son, I'm sorry. But God says he requires you. And he pulled the knife out. And just as he's getting ready to kill his son, God said, stop. He said, there's a lamb. And out of nowhere came a lamb. He said, don't kill your son. Kill this lamb. What's the point of this story? Abraham was the first preacher in the Bible. Abraham had the blessings that we all claim and wanted. And Abraham realized that the only way he could get blessed is if he was willing to make sacrifices to God. Abraham was so committed to God that he said, I'll give my only son and sacrifice him to God. Now, some of y'all say, yeah, I ain't doing that. Uh, that's crazy. Abraham's a fool. He was going to kill his son. The principle is this. Great sacrifice leads to great reward. Great sacrifice leads to great reward. Uh, I remember at Compton High, uh, I had a student named Dayton Jones. Long story short, Dayton played football for Compton High School. And, and the thing about Dayton was this. He came from a single parent home. He struggled. Uh, uh, the thing was, 
every day after football practice, Dayton would run around the track for an hour or two. After practice, now they done, they done went to school all day. They had football practice all night. Cali B kept them there tonight. The Y'all know, 9 o'clock at night. 9 o'clock at night. 10 or 10.30, he's running around the track. 10.30, he's running around the track. And I remember one time I was there late. I don't know why I was there so late. I'm like, man, what are you doing? He said, I'm just exercising. He got, he's kind of goof, caught, tall. He was goofy then. I'm just exercising. Hit H. Long story short, he was put in the work. Years later, he ended up getting a scholarship to UCLA. And thereafter, he ended up playing for the Raiders. He played for the Dallas Cowboys. They he played for the Green Bay Packers. He's on national TV. And one of the reasons why he was able to do that is because he was willing to sacrifice. He did the work. He put the effort in. He went the extra mile. And God says, if you want great reward, you have to have great sacrifice. You can't come to God and say, I, don't want, I ain't going to give you nothing. Give me everything. Because God says, if you ain't willing to do for me, I won't do for you. It is an old song by Mary, Mary J. Bly. If you do for me, I will do for you. That's what God said. If you do for me, I will do for you. But what we want to do is, we want God to give me everything, God, and you keep everything to yourself. And God said, that's not how it operates. He says, if you put me first, I'll put you first. But if you put me last, or I'm just on your list, he says, here's your curse. You'll be like your parents. You will work and struggle and die. You will work and struggle and die. You will work and struggle and die. But he said, if you put me first, you will live. And you will live an abundant life. I chose to follow God. And God has blessed me to have an abundant life. I don't have a billion dollars. I don't have the money of Bill Gates. But I am rich in spirit. I am rich in health. I am rich in joy. I have everything that I need because I kept God first. I'm not special from you. The difference between you and I is I believe this Bible. I'm a weirdo, bro. I believe this Bible. So I'm just so stupid. I think this Bible, everything in it is real. And because I'm so stupid, God says, bling, this is real. God says, bling, this is real. God says, favor here. Everywhere you go, favor. Children, favor. Finances, favor. Health, favor. Favor, favor. You want God to be a fan of you. Because if God is your fan, you will have favor everywhere you go. But if you are a favor of man, man will curse you. Men will talk about you as soon as you turn your back and walk away. Men will set traps for you. A young dog got caught up and killed by some friends that he knew. There wasn't strangers that killed that brother. There was people that he knew. You got to be careful because if you trust men, men will disappoint you and they will destroy you. But if you trust God, you will live forever. And the very last thing we've done after this, very last thing, turn to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Psalm 34. So put God first. Learn how to trust God. Learn how to trust his word. Read the Bible. Don't even listen to me. I'm an idiot. Don't listen to me. Read what God said. Be like, wow. Uh, let me test you, God. God says, test him and you will see. Turn to Psalm 34 and 17. Psalm 34 and 17. It says, the righteous cry and the Lord hear it and deliver them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near unto them that are of broken heart. And save it such as be of contrite and broken spirit. Depression is an attack of the enemy. Depression is an attack of the enemy. How many of y'all have ever been depressed? I was for a couple minutes in my life. I can't say that. I'm so stupid. Only a couple minutes in my life. What depression is, is this. Something happens. And whatever happens, it changed your life. For a moment, for a day, or for a lifetime. I recall when my sister died. And this is a sister you don't know her. This is when I was living in Arkansas. I was raised by, you know, mama and a different family. Long story short, one of mama's daughters died. And she was the baby of the children. And she died. She died, and mama had to bury her. Long story short, I watched mama at the funeral. And, and mama didn't shed a tear. 
In fact, when they sang the song, she jumped up and screamed, said, thank you, Jesus. And she was shouting and running around the church. This is at the funeral. She's shouting and, and, yes, thank you, God. I love you, God. And everybody was looking like, what is wrong with her? The thing was, she realized this. For God I live, for God I die. God says this, naked did I come into the world, naked shall I leave. Nothing in this world belongs to you. Because when you die, you can take nothing with you. Well, we have relationships, and those relationships are temporary. Because in heaven, you won't know him. You won't, I won't know you. I won't know Bishop. I won't know my wife. All these relationships are temporary. Because in heaven, they all start all over again. But see, the thing is, Mama knew that because she knew God's word. And she didn't focus on the fact that her daughter died. She focused on the life that she lived. The Bible says whatever you focus on starts to grow. If you focus on negativity, it grows. If you focus on brokenness, it grows. If you focus on pain, it grows. If you focus on death, that grows. Whatever you focus on starts to grow. The Bible says look at the good things. Don't focus on the bad things. you got to learn how to change your focus. Because God says I'll be there with you through the negative times. Through the bad time, through the pain, through the rain, through the storm. And he said, I will restore your heart, give you joy. Learn how to channel your focus. Because depression is from the enemy. Depression is, is, is a messenger that's sent to destroy you. Depression is sent to lead to alcoholism, lead to drug addiction, lead you to violence, lead you to curses. That's where Satan wants you to be. He wants you to focus on the things that you cannot change. But see, you can change peace. You can change love. And you can get happiness. Amen. Give God a hand clap. Hallelujah, everybody. I'm going to bring my own speaker. Amen. 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 Let's give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. God bless you guys. Amen. We we apologize for the music. We'll have that fixed by Sunday. But here's what I want you to realize. Life is a journey. And God says you can't be like the world. He says you got to be separate from them. He says don't even act like them. He said because I put more in you than I put in them. And you got to start to realize that you are special. Not only just by your look. Some of you are gorgeous. We have some beautiful young ladies here. And we have some very handsome young men. But it's not just your look that makes you special. It's what God put inside of you. Because, see, most of you have survived things that have destroyed many people. If, if, if I sat, sat down one day and had Joseph tell his life story, y'all would fall out and cry. If I sat down one day and had Taise tell his life story, y'all would run out the door and say, what? You wouldn't believe it. If I sat down one day and had Sister Merriman tell her story, I have Trey tell his story, I have Shania tell her story, if I had this young lady tell her story, some of you have endured terrible traumas and terrible pains, but you hear. Do you know why you're still standing? Because God put something in you. And he says, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Whatever he put in you, Helped you to still stand to this day. Because right now, you should have been gone. You should have been dead. Most people who went through what you went through and what you went through, especially what you went through and what you went through is gone. They're on the streets. They're homeless. They're out of their mind. They're in prison. They're the dead. But you still here because God said you're greater. And you got to start to believe that and understand that. You are special. And not just special to me, but special to God. And because you're special to him, he says, come out from among them. Be separate. And he says, go to your purpose. If you fulfill your purpose, you have all the money that you need. If you fulfill your purpose, you have everything that you want and desire. Learn how to work for God. Because God loves you so much. He, he wants to bless you. He really does want to bless you. But he won't bless you if you don't put him first. 
You got to learn how to put God first. And get up every morning and read your Bible. Every morning. I don't care if, it, if you only read one scripture. Just open it up, close it, and get on out the door. Read your Bible. That means you start the day off with God first. Start the day off with God first. And the thing is, you'll start to see your life change. Some of you got a little job, and, and I posted it. Why are you paying four dollars in tithes? You want to have forty dollar checks for the rest of your life? You want two or three jobs and still working to be broke? Why would you want that as a lifestyle? I didn't know that, but my wife taught me how to tithe. And I watch a lady. She, I made eighteen dollars an hour. She made six dollars an hour, and she always had more money than me. And it never it baffled me. I was like, this is retarded. This don't even make no sense. And then she says, Michael, write the check and leave it and walk away. And I'm like, I ain't giving no damn money, no church. I was over there cussing in the church. And I'm here, man. Walked out. An hour later, double K. I said, what the hell? I said, this up. And she said, I told you. When you trust God, he can do more than the world could ever do. Learn how to put it in God's hands. Because God wants to bless you. He wants to remove the curses that's over your family. And he wants you to be blessed. Because he wants to use you as an example. He wants you to be an example. You're his advertisement piece. He wants people to see, that's that fool Michael that used to run around and do all this. But look at him now. And people are like, is that him? He's 52. He can still move like that? I, I went to the dentist today, and the dentist was like, you ain't taking no medicine? No. You don't have no broken disc? No. You, you don't have this condition? No. And he was like, what? You 52? I said, yes. God is real. When you put God first, he will bless you. Learn how to put him first. And I commend each and every one of you. First of all, give yourselves a hand. Like, this is me. Clap, clap. You want to clap. Yes. This is for you. This is for you. This is for you. This is you. Clap for yourself. Because y'all do put God first. And you are examples to others. Now, here's what I command you. Shine. Shine. Let God bless you and use you. Shine. That means go forth in your purpose and do what he's called you to do. Some of y'all need to step out on faith and go and do what he's called you to do. Do what God's called you to do because you are special. You are special. And you'll see it. Right now, you're 19. Wait till you're 38. Wow. You're like, what? I can't believe. I can't believe that I used to be homeless, bro. I promise you. I was like, damn, I really, I really was homeless. I really had nothing. I really was sleeping in the streets. I can't believe that. If I can make it from homelessness, if I can make it from standing on a bridge ready to jump, <coughs> then you can make it too. Because you got to learn, put God first. And he'll be the greatest lineman you ever seen. Ladies, you don't know what that means, but the fellas do. He'll go before you and clear out everything. He'll go behind you and put, the, put, put all your drama and cover it up. He'll go to your side and put his angels on the side so the bullets will fall off. So the haters can't touch you. And God will bless you. Amen. Give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name. Anybody have any words when we wrap this up? Uh, I got a song to sing. Oh, now yeah. I like to say. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I here to be here today because it can be a lot easier to not be here like just to see yeah it was like yeah like me almost oversleep would have missed it like you feel me but i felt like i needed to be here so i just want to thank you for taking the time out today consistently like the years that you've been doing it 
it's still right. being there because it's not easy like at all like it sounds easy and we talk about it like yeah we be here but like i'm i know we're all getting older and we're starting to experience it and we're seeing it for ourselves oh yeah life is just like it's crazy you feel yeah. me so it's like being here is just an accomplishment in itself so amen give me a hand clap hallelujah amen everybody grab a hand grab a hand dear heavenly father we thank for the word that went forth. we thank for these young people father we ask for forgiveness of sins. Father, please forgive us of sins, Father. Please forgive us for what we've done wrong. Father, help us become better. Father, help us to put you first. Father, help us to see the enemy, to see the truth that you've given us, and to know that the devil is a liar, that he wants to destroy us. Squeeze the hand next to you. I squeeze life into the hand. I squeeze prosperity into the hand. I squeeze blessings into the hand. That these young people come to head and not to tail, that they become victorious and never defeated, and that no weapon formed against them shall prosper, Father. We speak life, we speak health, and we thank you, Father, for another Thanksgiving. We thank you, Father, for the food that's being prepared. We thank you, Father, for our loved ones. And Father, help us to forgive those who've trespassed us and help us become better versions of ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God a hand clap. Hallelujah! <laughs> We got Papa John. Oh, I forgot to bring the chicken. Oh, man.